My guest today is James Camus, a retired geologist with 42 years of experience. Got my Bachelor of Science degree in geology from Northern Illinois University, my Master of Science degree in geology from Idaho State University. And uh, during and primarily working in oil and gas during my career, we, which really helped me because I worked with some laboratories on, um, on looking at how uh, geological uh, processes affect climate. And I've been working on this project to find out how geology impacts climate uh, for many, many years, 1977. Today, we're going to look at the geological impacts uh, on climate. There's a pretty graphic demonstration of that. So I've, uh, after working for so many years on this, I'm totally convinced that uh, geological forces greatly influence and in some cases completely control climate and climate-related events. So it kind of begs the question, if I'm so certain of that, why haven't climate scientists and uh, media outlets not considered geological impacts as so significant? There's, there's really a lot of uh, explanations to that. I've picked the top three here. First one is uh, remoteness. On the left side, you can see that that is the Pacific Ocean, covers in this perspective half. If you look at all the oceans, they cover 71%. Their average depth is 14,000 feet. Attempts to get down there with a the route, uh, submarines really have found it difficult. And current mapping of the uh, oceans is inadequate. It really doesn't give you a lot of detail so that you can find geological features such as volcanoes or hydrothermal vents, which are ocean floor hot geysers. So 71%. Another 11% of our planet is covered by polar ice sheets, and that adds up to about 11%. It's difficult to go through, and they, they average about 7,000 feet of ice, so it's difficult to get down there, look at the geology, figure out what things are doing. Next one, and probably the most important one, is lack of monitoring. The image here of some volcanic chains, each of them is about 1,600 miles long, and all of these are... Uh, on the ocean bottom and buried deep in the ocean. You may notice on the far right of this, there is a dark blue area. That's called the Mariana Trench. It is the deepest ocean location on Earth. It's about 36,000 feet deep. Then there's a little rise onto these uh, chains of uh, volcanoes. They're right at about 20,000 feet. Well, another important thing about lack of monitoring is latest estimates that there are 3 million, 3 million uh, ocean floor geological features. Very, very few of them are monitored. So it makes it especially significant um, to realize we just don't know what fluids they're emitting. The few cases we have uh, of detailed mapping, one of them is offshore California, they did an older research study, and they found that there were 47 geological features on the ocean floor in this specific area. A follow-up study went to the same exact area and with more modern mapping techniques, found 572 features. So that really speaks to the fact that we need more monitoring. The last reason that um, geological features have remained hidden is what I call interpretation bias. All of us through the years have recalled uh, theories that were at the time were considered 100% correct, and then they later turn out to be not correct. This is a geological example. It relates to continental drift. In 1912, a German scientist who had a strong background in geology, meteorology, and geophysics, that's when you see things, shoot sound waves, proposed that climates a long time ago stuck together. As evidence, he said he could fit the continents back together like a puzzle. And you can see this if you look at the northwest portion of Africa, which is kind of rounded, and you move it to the left, to the west, it, can, it fits very well into the Gulf of Mexico. 
Another example is South America. If you move it to the right, it fits in very well to uh, Africa, the West Coast of Africa. Well, Mr. Wagner's theory was uh, ridiculed. And the consensus 100% uh, uh -huh. experts at the time said it was ridiculous. He didn't have enough evidence. And there was even a couple of articles in some New York uh, newspapers that really slammed him. Turns out that it wasn't until the 1950s and early 60s that his theory was proven correct. So it took a long time there. But this is uh, interpretation bias uh, and a geological prospect. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through an examples of areas that uh, you wouldn't think, but that had a lot of geological activity. We'll start with Antarctica, then we're going to shift to the Arctic, then we'll shift to El Nino. Uh, if time permits, we'll go to a few others, which are really interesting. All right, let's start with Antarctica. Geological extent, this gives you a perspective. You can see the lower 48 states there. And um, Antarctica is significantly larger. The other thing here I posted was that there's two specific regions in Antarctica. Obviously, posted there is East Antarctica 80%, West Antarctica 20%. So, a lot of research studies have shown that 100% of the glacial ice melting uh, occurs in West Antarctica. And East Antarctica is actually gaining ice. So, this is a a proxy for ice thickness, it's actual global sea level rise. I want to point out that there's a West Antarctic level and it is rising sea level a bit, about six millimeters. And then if you connect that with the Antarctic Peninsula, they're actually the same thing that makes up West Antarctica. So why is West Antarctica 100% uh, of the cause of the melting, the left side shows why. This is a skin temperature map put out by um, Dr. Stieg, University of Washington. He also is on the NOAA, one of the NOAA projects. And what it shows in red is the a higher heat flow. This is a skin temperature map. It has some details to it. We'll just leave it right now to there's higher heat flow in West Antarctica and normal heat flow in East Antarctica. You also observe that the distinction between these two heat areas is uh, it's remarkable. It's not fuzzy, it changes immediately. So that is really not characteristic of uniform warming of the planet. It just is kind of odd. On the right is the answer as to why that's so odd. It's a big fault zone, uh, oftentimes termed the West Antic Rift. We can think of it as a big fault zone uh, it extends about 3,000 miles from north to south. So you can see the black lines. There's two bounding faults. And then it's about 1,000 miles wide. This is a very active fault system. It has a lot of movement on faults. And these tap down into very deep uh, lava pockets. And this heat and some of the lava is transmitted upward, upwards to the uh, base of the bedrock. So the ice is above it. And it, uh, in addition to generating heat, it generates a lot of geological features such as uh, volcanoes or sub-ocean hydrothermal vents. So what about the oceans uh, that lie along the coast of West Antarctica? Obviously, you can see here that the oceans are extremely warm on the west, uh, on the oceans that border the west side of West Antarctica, and that correspondingly, the oceans on the East Antarctica coastlines hardly show anything. So this is, again, confirmation that uh, heat flow, probably melting some of ice, warming it, and sending out this warm water into the ocean, um, it substantiates the fact that Antarctica's, West Antarctica is pretty darn active. Many people think that um, the Glacial ice deposits in Antarctica are just this uniform ice. There's really nothing that inter uh, interferes with it. 
Well, that's not correct. Here's some broke off pieces of glacier and you can see these really dark layers. Those layers are volcanic eruptions. It's the ash from those volcanic eruptions. Now shown here is some of the ice cores. So they drill down through uh, a lot of the glacial ice in Antarctica and they also see these in the ice cores. These ice cores are close to 6 million years old. So for 6 million years, there's been volcanoes erupting on here. Now we're going to switch a little, a little bit south on the, oh, excuse me, on the northern end of the West Antarctic Rift. And this is in the Sandwich Islands areas. On the left is one of the islands. Uh, it is a huge uh, collapsed volcano like Crater Lake. So the way this works is there was a giant volcano here uh, millions of years ago, and it erupted so violently that it blew off the bed section and top of this large volcano, and uh, it left this open bay there. So that's a really, really interesting feature. Uh, now you see those smaller uh, triangular shapes, which are other volcanoes. Uh, they have erupted recently. Several of them uh, erupted in the uh, early 90s. Most recently, several of them erupted in 2016. There were some research stations here, and the ash covered them. So this area is obviously pretty darn active. Then we're going to switch over to the right. You see a lot of dots. Uh, those are earthquakes. And you can see the uh, brown areas. That's the northern extent of the uh, of the Western Arctic Rift. And uh, in 2020, there was a series of 85,000 85, earthquakes that occurred in this northern area. It, it was totally unexpected, but it really uh, showed that there's a lot going on here in this northern area. Now we're going to fit, uh, switch and go a little bit farther south. We're going to take a look at the Larsen Volcanic Plateau. On the left is a map of that. You can see the prominent black lines. That's the west bounding fault and east bounding fault of the West Antarctic Rift. The Larsen Volcanic Plateau is there. You can see it. It's, it's an above sea level plateau, long, narrow from west to east. You can also see a lot of uh, volcanoes on that one. Kind of a little bit more difficult to see is the melting of the sea ice in and around the volcanic plateau. It progressed outward for a number of years. I think you can read those numbers. Well, again, why would it progress away from uh, a hot volcanic area rather than being uh, uniform global warming uh, receding the ice? The reason, um, well, the best reason is on the upper right. These are cinder cones. They are the triangles on the left. And they're obviously absent of ice, which indicates there's a lot of heat flow there. Uh, you, in the distance, you can see the other remaining 16. Additional information is that early explorers uh, started here, which was a tough area to start. And they wrote down that they found large amounts of ash across this ice, indicating there were eruptions not too long ago. The Chile a Chilean university always uh, also came here, I think, in um, 1985, and they witnessed, uh, witnessed a lot of volcanic ash. Now we're going to move uh, to the central portion of the rift. Can you see the, the uh, black lines? And we're going to look at, uh, in the center there, the Marie Bird Mantle Plume Hotspot. So what is the mantle plume? The uh, viscous magma accumulations, pockets of it deep in the earth, sometimes uh, get overpressurized and they rise in a column up towards the surface. And one of them rose underneath Marie Bird. And when they get to the surface, they are run out of steam, and they push out laterally. So we'll look at one of those plumes a little later. So this hot spot, you can see there's some really, really uh, hot areas. One is marked the Pine Island Glacier, the other one the Thortes. 
So these two glaciers, first the Pine Island Glacier has been the poster child for global warming for many, many years because they noticed that the ice was melting very rapidly and there was a lot of it melting. More recently, you can see the Thortes Glacier, same type of thing. Uh, this has been labeled as the Doomsday Glacier. I'm not sure why the scientists and the media got so excited. This is NOAA data. It's not the hidden data, so they know about this. I'm not sure why they did that. So on the right slide is a little bit of detail on the catchment basins of the Pine Island Glacier and the Thorides Glacier. So you can see in detail here that there's numerous large and uh, small volc volcanoes under these two areas. The Pine Island one, I, um, University in Indiana, uh, concluded from their research study that there is a currently erupting volcano beneath the Pine Island Glacier. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if you have an erupting volcano, it's going to melt ice. When you look at the Thortes Glacier, some of the research studies uh, have been able to get to the edges of the ice accumulation and look up underneath it. And they found open caves with indications of little bacteria underneath it. So the bacteria only grows when there's heat. This indicates there's geothermal heat flow there. The other thing is these two glaciers are surrounded by glaciers that haven't lost uh, much ice, especially when you look to the Thortes Glacier to the, uh, the east of it. Oh, one other thing. On the right slide, you can see a big volcano there called Mount Tehakiki. It uh, hasn't broke through the ice, but they did research on it, and they found that um, many millions of years ago, it exploded, and it, they're certain that it changed the climate of Earth, the southern portion of the of Earth, uh, Germanically. I believe this is the last thing about uh, Antarctica. What we're looking at is the Myrtle Dry Valleys. It's on the far southern end of the West Antarctic Rift. And it's not really something um, that you would associate with Antarctica. Normally, you see pictures of a flat area, somebody struggling to walk across the ice with snow in their face. You really don't think about an area that's so absent of, of ice. Well, uh, I think that uh, this is the result of it being close to a major eruption of Mount Erebus. It's just off to the scream in the lower left part of this, and it has put a lot of heat in here. You'll notice that there are volcanic layers here, not rock layers. So <clears throat> you can also see on that left slide some light blue lines. Research has shown that underneath this glacier, at the bedrock uh, glacier interface, there are liquid, liquid flowing rivers, and they move to the southwest and coalesce, and they eventually um, exit. Uh, you can see in the bottom there, the red dot, Blood Falls, and this lake there is liquid and fresh water. On the lower right is Blood Falls, the exit point of the streams. For years, people have pondered, well, why is the water red? And they've made a lot of suggestions, bacteria, other things. Turns out that in my analysis, this is iron. Just like you see in Yellowstone, streams that are full of iron. So the streams, subglacial, cross against uh, over volcanic layers, which typically have a lot of iron in them. And so this redness is related to geological uh, phenomenon. And the upper right is just one that I like showing people, people in the McMurdo Dry area. Here's a liquid freshwater stream, no ice, a really kind of regular looking stream. What's of great interest is here's a scientist collecting some samples, no Arctic gloves on, light jacket, jacket, baseball hat. So this is just an interesting one to me. It shows well. Temperatures pretty high there in the Myrtle Drive Valley. Oh, and again, 
it's surrounded by glaciers that instantaneously are much greater thickness, so the heat flow is localized. Oh, forgot this one. I think everybody knows about the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's a earthquake and fault system that starts in the southern part of um, South America, wraps around all of the Pacific Ocean, and it stops uh, somewhere uh, south of Australia. This is an extremely active feature, probably the most active one on Earth. 80% of all the major earthquakes occur along this. And I think it's about 50% of all major volcanic eruptions occur here. To my know uh, knowledge, no one has ever suggested that the West Antarctic Rift is actually the last link because the ring of fire isn't a ring, it's a horseshoe. So you could down there and prominently put the West Antarctic Rift. So what are my reasons to thinking that this is an actual segment? If you low, look at the lower right portion of this image, you'll see uh, a line, a dark black line. Uh, one of them represents the West Antarctic Rift. And then as you go farther east, you can see that that black line forms a little cove and it wraps around and it connects to the West Antarctic Rift. We're not going to take the time to show you a lot of geological evidence, but the evidence clearly shows that there's a seamless connection in the faults and the geology. Same thing is true over on the uh, left, lower left side of the West Antarctic Rift. It connects seamlessly up into the uh, New Zealand and the West Antarctic Fault. Another thing is uh, proof that it's part of the Ring of Fire is that there's been a lot of earthquakes. We just looked at 85,000, and we've looked at a lot of volcanic eruptions along the rift. So the a number, the density of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions here is pretty close to the density of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes along the Pacific Ring of Fire. Now we're going to switch to the Arctic. I know that, uh, and the Europeans know that uh, Iceland, this is an eruption on Iceland, has a lot of volcanic activity and people have just adjusted to it. This eruption, which happened in 2016, was a wake-up call. Uh, it was more violent. It sent more ash up into the atmosphere. There was a lot of effects. Most of the uh, airlines have shut down uh, their planes for a long time because of the ash. The ash settled on a lot of places. In Europe and Scotland, there were tremendous health issues. So this was a game changer. So that's our introduction to Antarctica. Now let's take a look at the regional geological setting of the Arctic region. Um, there's a black lines, hatched black lines, as we've talked about. This are several rift systems. They're very long. I think the one on the right uh, is about 5,000 miles long, about 1,000 miles wide. Uh, it's called the Mid-Arctic Rift. And you can see some hatched uh, areas that are inside that. These are hotspots, just like the Marie Bird hotspot. And um, they have a lot of effect. We'll talk about some of those effects, especially effects in Greenland. To the west side of this is... Um, to the north, a Russian peninsula called Kamchatka, and this hotspot extends to the south along Alaska. It's really well known if you're a geologist and hopefully an interested person in geology that there are hundreds uh, of active volcanoes along the Alaska part, maybe less known. There are hundreds of them along the Kamchatka Peninsula. That black line there is not a rift, it's where two pieces of continents slam together. And the uh, red area and that plate goes underneath the other plate, and that activates a lot of movement, upward movement of, of magma. A lot of interest in sea ice melting, of course. So 
why is there melting um, such great melting in here? The answer is again uh, some hot spots. Uh, oh, by the way, the white is obviously um, the ice sheet. So on the upper right, you can see the mid uh, Arctic Rift system. It uh, obviously it explodes, it expulses a lot of heat, and it melts. Uh, typically melts a lot of the ice on that area. You can see the white hatched. Now, this other area to the, excuse me, to the left part of the screen shows some big uh, red lines and an arrow. The left image explains what those are. They're ocean currents. And you can see the red lines here that cut across the Bering Sea. And this is a better illustration of the uh, subduction zone that we talked about, all the volcanoes in Alaska on up to the Kamchatka Peninsula. And he's warm, tremendously warm. The Bering Sea, the currents carry those and coalesce up the Bering Strait and empty into the western portion of the Arctic area. They melt the ice. Let's talk about Iceland. We looked at that big explosion. People are used to it. Um, this uh, shows the bounding faults here in red. And you can see some areas, um, indications, some um, triangles that show that it's separating, so it's active. However, Iceland is divided into two areas. You can see on the lower part here, vaguely see it says east, volcanic zone. This is the one that has traditionally been very active. It's where this big explosion happened. Conversely, you can see kind of to the left or west of that on a small label is the west volcanic zone. This one was thought to be very inactive. Recently, there's been huge lava flows. Those, it says recently increased volcanism that happened very close to the capital. They almost made it there 20 miles from that. Um, so that shows that this West Antarctic area has become very active, not really distinct. Another interesting, um, I'll call it development in Antarctic is uh, on the left, there's two volcanoes there I'll explain their difference uh, on the right. On the left, you can see the Okaval volcano there. That's what we're going to take a look at in detail. So first you notice that there's two uh, circles here. Those are black circles. Those are volcanoes. They're separated by two miles. Two miles. The Okta volcano is completely absent of ice. So it's unusual to look two miles to the uh, southeast and see that this volcano, same height, same type of volcano is completely covered by glacial ice. Again, how do you do that uh, with uniform uh, temperature, uh, global ice melting? You can't. So the red dashes in there are um, faults, a series of them that are associated with the West Volcanic area. And it's not uncommon for heat flow to cut across one area from faults and not to the other area. That's what's happening here. This is a, a subglacial volcanic eruption sending out a lot of gas. So this kind of addresses how much CO2 in the atmosphere is volcanic. Uh, no one had really monitored this Katla um, subglacial volcano. Somebody finally did, and they calculated that 5% of all the volcanic CO2 emitted into the atmosphere was accounted for in these two uh, plumes. That, that's kind of unusual, and I don't really believe that. Now, part of it is that if you look how they measure uh, volcanic CO2 versus human CO2, it's not an exact science, even though they say it is. There's a lot of different types of carbon dioxide and when you look at those, they vary. You can see charts that show the human 
or a supposedly human carbon dioxide is really not one specific type of carbon. It's all those variables. And um, same thing was were true with supposedly uh, fossil generated carbon dioxide. There's a lot of variations in it. And these two signatures overlap. So I'm not a, I'm not well versed in carbon isotopes. And I admit that this is a, a little bit of a stretch for me, but I feel strongly about this, that eventually they'll find another 5%, another 5%, and they're going to eventually agree that volcanic CO uh, is a primary contributor to CO2 in the planet. Now we're going to shift to Greenland. On the left uh, is a familiar outline. That's Greenland. What you can see here is NASA's uh, calculation of heat flow beneath the Greenland glacier. And you can see that there are a lot of places there that are unusually warm. That black line is the trace of one of the um, uh, one of the very warm areas. You can see that it's prominent to the uh, southeast there. It's a little vaguer as you go to the northern area. But supporting evidence shows that the Iceland, current Iceland mantle plume, of course, Iceland, as we uh, talked about, is very active. Uh, Greenland went across this mantle plume and uh, it heated up a lot of the rocks. They retain this heat. Also, I think, and it's pretty convincing, that there's a rift here and it's still emitting some of the heat. Now, why do I think that? If you look on the right, you can see again an image of uh, Iceland. It's the central and upper portion. And recent research discovered a thousand mile long river, uh, excuse me, stream, lake, and river system that flows north and extends for a thousand miles and eventually em empties into the uh, Bransford Strait. So the black areas are uh, lakes. So there's some pretty big lakes in there. So this is substantiation that there's strong heat flow in there and creating some big stream systems. Some follow-up evidence uh, to uh, that uh, warm areas in Greenland is a research study that kind of cut through that central area. Uh, you can see the slice through here. It goes from uh, west on the uh, left, uh, the left side to east on the right side. Their research showed that there was a lot of subglacial lakes and streams, kind of a confirmation on the other research study. And you can see on the lower right, that's a huge area. You can also see that on the left there, they're showing a lot of basal ice heat flow. It's that broad red spot. So again, a lot of research says that the ice is melting in Greenland. This is another one for me that's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, NASA uh, recently has uh, said that they have found um, asteroid impact uh, underneath the ice in Greenland, we're looking at the northern extent of Greenland. This is uh, the first one is there. It's called Hiawatha. The second one is a little farther to the right. This map is a topographic, subglacial topographic elevation of this portion of Iceland. You can see that there are some long linear uh, differential areas of elevation. The one in the upper uh, right is pretty distinct. There's a very low area in blue. If you look at the upper, well, that's the, if you look at the upper right, hopefully got those directions correct, you can see some black lines that border big changes in um, topography. So now let's take a look back at where the craters are. These lines are not as definite, but they're def definitely there. I've done other research on there. So the primary crater is located along a long linear fault. 
progressing from the uh, right side to the bottom. And then there's a cross-cutting fault. You can see that it kind of co you know, stops the red uh, one. And then in the upper right, you can see that that cross fault uh, is certainly linked with a topographic area. So why does this make any difference? Well, many, many volcanoes are associated with faults. And these faults go down to the inner earth, like we talked about. The magma goes upward, creates super volcanoes, collapsed volcanoes, like we looked at. This first crater is a collapsed volcano, not an asteroid strike, as well as the second one. So what does this have to do with the uh, climate? Well, it doesn't, it looks like astronomical uh, phenomenon are not causing this. Volcanoes, uh, so they send, as we've talked about, large amounts of heat, carbon dioxide, and methane into the atmosphere. Another look at Greenland. Uh, on the left is uh, the northern part of Greenland. The red hatched areas are hot spots there that we've talked about. Here's an interesting fault uh, from the lower uh, left to the upper right is the Bransfield Strait, which we mentioned before. This represents a very significant fault system. It's uh, two pieces that move laterally, laterally, not up and down. You can see the black arrows. Uh, Greenland has been moved 150 miles through time toward the uh, northeast, and it's currently settled in a slice of Canada that's called Ayers Ellesmere Island. So why is this of great interest? If you look at the lower left, you can see the uh, Devon Island. It's a, a subglacial circular area. How much of the research proves that it's a subglacial volcano? Well, there's two black lines that go underneath that. They're subglacial faults, and research mapping shows that those areas are extremely hot and that there are subglacial lakes there. Then if you look at the Tracy Helpin area, you can see some more black lines. And the Tracy volcano, the bay of it has received, uh, receded tremendously. Correspondingly, the Helpin Glacier is the glacial ice in this valley has not receded at all. So, pretty interesting confirmation. On the right are a series of craters, of very ancient craters. And we're going to talk about how that relates to the Greenland uh, craters. So, when we look down to the south, there is the Hudson Lake, the Hudson Bay, and there's a circular feature there. Another one called the Nasta uh, Arc, a lot of mineral evidence. It's not an asteroid. And these uh, craters progressively get uh, older from the south to like 6 billion, 400 million, and eventually up to the uh, craters, the Nava Nasa craters, they're about uh, 66 million years old. So this string uh, shows that. Uh, it's fault-bounded, not asteroids. Another interesting aspect occurred uh, recently um, in the Arctic Ocean. You can see some of the faults again in black lines. And what these uh, red areas represent is a very sudden, sudden expulsion of methane from the seafloor that rose into the atmosphere. The red is the outline of that atmospheric methane. So um, NASA satellites picked this up. It happened instantaneously. It uh, lasted for about two weeks. But the fact that it's over directly overlies the faults is a strong indication that it's uh, methane emitted from the faults and Arctic Ocean floor geological features. Now we're going to totally switch to El Ninos. All of us know that El Ninos are one of the most influential uh, climate uh, phenomenon on Earth. On the left there, you can see a temperature representation of El Nino. 
it's that cone shaped thing uh, and then the heat, uh, the left part of the heat, that uh, red uh, that red circle is the origin point of all El Ninos through history and all El Ninos that the scientists have looked at um, more recently. So they all progress over there and along the, and end up at the western portion of South America. You can also see that the boundaries of this are very distinct. The temperature, excuse me, the temperature changes very quickly. So what's a good analogy to that? And also adds evidence that I think that the source point is geologic. On the upper right portion here, we can see a volcano. This is a image from space of that volcano as it erupts. You can see it has a point source. And it spreads out to the right with the ash uh, getting into the atmosphere in a cone shape. Looks like El Nino. Good. To the uh, lower right side is a, uh, excuse me, temperature map of uh, part of the Pacific Ocean. So when I've looked at these, uh, this area, heat map in this area, uh, there's a, uh, v, a video, three-dimensional video. We'll look at it in a, a second or two. You can see that there are definite pulses of heat. So the El Nino doesn't form in some uniform fashion. There are bursts or pulses of heat. Well, that's what volcanoes do. They erupt a little bit, then they settle back, then they erupt a little more. As I just said, this is a screenshot of a three-dimensional video put to together by uh, NASA. It's fascinating. You should really look at it. I think I have a uh, hyperlink to it in my website. So the lower right, uh, excuse me, the bottom, there's a cross section through uh, the map on the top. And what it shows in red, on the video is the development of the El Nino. You can see the heat pulses there. And when you look at the video, uh, these heat pulses stay very uh, together as they move to the, uh, to the right, uh, to the uh, east. Where there's an arrow that shows the source point, it coincides exactly uh, with the first version we looked at with that source point of all El Ninos is, and you can see that it's super hot. You can also see some red areas that point down in a spike time of fashion. Now they don't exactly reach the bottom of the ocean because our ability to get temperatures in the body or on the bottom of the ocean are limited. However, to me, interpreting these spikes and showing that they go down toward the bottom of the ocean, it um it confirms that uh, that source point, which is so geologically active, uh, is pushing these uh, spikes up into the ocean. Well, now we're going to change to uh, major ice cycles. You're probably used to seeing uh, the term major ice ages. I think that's a misnomer. I think there's actually phases to uh, say ice accumulations. Um, so the first phase is uh, is when uh, the uh, ice ages completely cover most of Earth. Uh, then, uh, referring to the graph below, they almost instantaneously disappear. So you can look at uh, the numbers one, two, three, and four, and that represents the instanta instantaneous melting of these glaciers. This graph shows. Uh, uh, temperature, uh, atmospheric temperature, uh, and in blue is uh, CO2 emissions. So the way the graph is configured, the spikes to the bottom are the maximum temperature and the maximum expulsion of CO2. So when you look at these graphs, each one of them, after the expulsion, they kind of close uh, in a fashion toward the 
uh, top of the graph. And uh, so this is a relatively long phase, um, unlike the melting phase, which is about 5,000 years. This phase is about 50,000 years. And eventually, so that's a cycle number two, eventually um, things become stable. The amount of CO2 and temperature in the atmosphere becomes stable. I call this the normal phase. So that's why I think these are cycles. Interesting enough, if you look to the right uh, of this graph, you can see another spiked area. That's today. So what's interesting about that is you can vaguely see some up and downs, short time period up and downs in that. So it indicates, again, that these pulses of volcanic activity, which melt it, are not uniform. So today we see changes in temperature and CO2 that happen across relatively short intervals. That's been interpreted as um, human-induced changes. I, I believe, although it's a, not a pu proven hypothesis of mine, that um, this is what's happening today. We're seeing some supposedly rapid changes due to uh, humans. Now we're going to switch to uh, ocean floor microplastics. All of us know that there's a lot of plastic waste in our rivers and um, large areas, areas of it that float on the ocean. We need to stop that. I'm 100% behind that. We need to start controlling the plastic we have on the ocean and our rivers, this industrial plastic. However, a, uh, again, I think it was released in 2016, a research study um, put down um, super pressure resistance uh, probes into several some deep areas. They were able to capture a little bit of sediment. Uh, so a lot of these deep areas where they got the Sediments are located along the Pacific Ring of Fire here. There's the Mariana Trench, 36,000, wrap around to Chile, 20, uh, 27, 7,000 feet dip. They um, ascribed the accumulations of teeny pieces of plastic they found in these muds to um, breakup of the surface plastic, plastics, and uh, then they settled down into the ocean. A lot of problems with that. The first one is that the microplastics they found are 0.1 to 0.2 inches in diameter. So 0.1 inches to 0.2 is pretty darn um, a small. You barely see it on your fingernail. So huh, here's another few problems. How do you take those particular small pieces and they drop to 36,000 feet. They just have too much buoyancy. It's not going to work. Additionally, um, some of these things would diffuse laterally, even if they sunk a little bit from surface ocean currents. It just wouldn't happen. My explanation is that these deep trenches, which we talked about that are active, um, emit a lot of these chemicals. They're under extreme pressure because of the column of uh, column of ocean water above them. And uh, they also expulse a number of minerals, actually hundreds of them. Uh, one important one is natural gas. If you apply pressure to natural gas, extreme pressure, it separates out uh, the methane and out something called ethanol gas. Well, uh, that's how they make industrial plastics. They take natural gas, which is 90% methane. They put it to extreme pressures, extreme heat. They uh, separate the methane and this ethanol gas. Uh, the ethanol gas, they convert into a resin, and that's the plastics. So that, again, is what's happening at this uh, deep uh, ocean areas. They mimic this process. 
Here's a favorite one to everybody, the dinosaur extinction event. Dinosaur extinction has been pretty down uh, popular. Everybody knows about it. As schools teach it. It turns out to be uh, not true. Based on my inter interpretation of uh, Dr. Gerda Keller's uh, research, she's a professor emeritus at Princeton. She and her teams have been working for over 20 years, taping samples around the world of specific uh, chemicals, primarily iridium, which is a deep earth uh, mineral. And what they found was that um, the timing of the asteroid strike, shown on the upper right there, you can see a circle indicating a crater or an asteroid strike. That asteroid timing does not coincide with the extinction of the dinosaurs. And that uh, asteroid supposedly caused instantaneous extinction of all dinosaurs and many creatures on Earth. Well, Dr. Keller's research showed that there are a series of flood volcanoes, which they researched and found in uh, central India, huge portion of central India. And these basalt layers are shown on the left. You can see the multiple flood layers. They found that these individual uh, flood basalts uh, matched the extinction of the dinosaurs. And they showed that these extinctions did not happen instantaneously, rather in several pulses of floods. Dr. Kelly's right. Here's another interesting phenomena, maybe a little too esoteric, uh, maybe not too many people are familiar with it, but there was a uh, current change in what's called the Gulf Stream. If we've uh, researched it at all, you know that it kind of circumvents the Atlantic Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, and it's what uh, early explorers used to go from Europe. The current carries them towards uh, their destinations uh, in the Caribbean and other areas. They stayed there for a while. Then they were able to follow the current which circulates uh, back up uh, towards Greenland and eventually carries them back to Europe, the Gulf Stream. Well, um, in about, you know, I think it was 2015, a research studied uh, supposedly proved that the Gulf Stream current was shutting down. It wasn't moving anymore, attributed to changes in heat in the ocean. On the left is, um, and blue is the uh, uh, Gulf Stream current progressing uh, northward along the side of uh, eastern, our eastern uh, coast. And you can see, excuse me, this is a velocity map of the ocean current. You can see that it very rapidly moves uh, from the south, the Caribbean islands, progresses north along the coast very rapidly, and suddenly it stops. It just stops. That's what the scientists said. Well, it turns out it slows down. And you can see that uh, slowdown occurred at a cross-cutting fault of an extension of the Mid-Arctic Rift. So uh, that seems pretty unusual. Uh, what would be the cause of that? The explanation is on the right. Now you can see Greenland there. You can see some of the cross faults. And this is a representation from another research study that shows the heat, the surface of the heat uh, during the time period where there was the shutdown. You can see obviously there's a lot of heat flow from Iceland and Greenland. And then suddenly uh, that warm blob stops by a cross fault. In, ad in addition to the surface temperature, um, they found that this uh, heat went all the way to the ocean floor, probably where it encountered a lot of, excuse me, some ocean floor volcanic things. So to me, this is pretty strong evidence that the current slowdown was not related to warming of the uh, ocean. 
by human sources or other geological sources. So here are some final thoughts. This is an image on the left of a mantle plume, which we talked about later. And you can see on the bottom of that, that it starts uh, in a column. The molten lava from deeper in the earth progresses upward. And the, the mantle plume is really thick. And it progresses upward, and some of the plume pushes up through faults, like we talked about at the Murray Bird area in Antarctica. And it pushes the uh, crustal rocks apart. Uh, generates the volcanoes and the uh, rifts uh, that we've uh, talked about. Now, the, um, the scale of this image is correct. So if you look at the thickness of the mantle plume and compa compare it to the thickness of the outer uh, crust of our planet, which is typically known as the land layer, and the ocean layer, which you can hardly see, it shows that these layers are absolutely minuscule compared to the geological force beneath it. So that's a pretty good summary of uh, my theory. Another recent development has uh, stunned the scientific community, especially those which work on climate models. This study that was released uh, a week ago by the University of Cambridge, obviously a very respected university. And they found out that volcanism um, contributed to a change in the atmosphere far greater than had been anticipa anticipated. So they said that the volcanic proportion of uh, heating and CO2 in the atmosphere was four times greater than previously a thought. So uh, that really is forcing them, hopefully, to um, update all the clear, uh, current climate models. That's what the uh, researchers at Cambridge said. I haven't shown all of their quotes from their study, but they say the climate models need to be updated that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. So one uh, quote here from their study is, scientists have discovered that standard climate predictions may undervalue the surface temperature cooling effect of volcanic eruptions by a multiple of two to even four. So that's the final thoughts on geological things. Now I'm going to do... Uh, I guess you consider a little sales thing. Uh, I am selling a new book. But the really important thing about that is it's about 200 pages long. I've been working on it for many, many years. It uh, discusses in much greater detail the things we've looked at today and even more things. It shows all the research studies uh, that are involved in this. Uh, so it really adds a lot more information. I'd recommend that you consider getting it and reading through it. Um, I'm a geologist. <laughs> uh, it's fairly well written, but it has a lot of diagrams. I think it will really help you. You also may want to refer to my plate climatology website. The hyperlink is shown there. Again, I've been working on it since 1977. All the ideas and hypotheses uh, that I've shown here are present on the hyperlink. It's got more than 80 of my articles that I've posted since 2014. Do you have time for a question or two? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just looking here uh, at this uh, report of a spike of, in temperatures in the oceans in the North Atlantic recently. I don't know if you've seen those headlines and if you have any opinion of what's happening there, what's causing that. I do. Again, as you might think, my response is going to be geological. So if you look at the northern extension of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a rift beneath it. And that rift 
uh, has been proven to have, again, uh, volcanoes that are currently erupting. One of the research studies was by a um, Swedish university, um, uh, University of Bergen, and part, a segment of that heat in the northern part of the Atlantic, about a 700 mile long that, um, they researched. And to their amazement, they found all sorts of huge volcanoes uh, that were close to the surface. Several of them had broken through and formed some islands. And they found uh, a lot of hydrothermal vents. If you go a little farther north on the uh, Atlantic Ocean, where the heat is slowing up, there's an island complex called the Salvard area. Um, the Salvard is known to have a lot of faults on its west side. Those are part of the rift uh, system. And those faults, research shows, are emitting the ocean floor parts of them, tremendous amounts of methane. So like we talked about, methane is emitted to get a lot of the uh, microplastics go. There's a lot of methane coming out of that and it's probably associated with heat. So when you combine all of that, what you see is that a portion of the Atlantic Ocean uh, is moving up into uh, to the central part of the Atlantic Ocean. There's a couple other um, interesting things to mention about that. The uh, articles in which uh, climate scientists are saying and in the media is that this warming is causing the North Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean to become uh, acid. They call it acidation. Okay, uh, those are words. Let's think about the data. The uh, pH, which is a me measurement of acidity, so the higher number is it's more basic, uh, the lower number, I think I've got that correct, is more acid. So for many, many years, I think two or 300 years, the acidity of the uh, of the uh, area here at the Atlantic has been eight, a point one. So the larger numbers are less acidic. So recently it's changed to 8.12. I think I've got that correct. So is that a lot of acidation? Uh, should we overwhelm that this is a great a problem? Uh, no. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, very good. Uh, I think there is uh, a feeling among skeptics even that the oceans are so big and volcanoes are so relatively small that volcanoes couldn't actually be heating up the ocean. But I do like this uh, this uh, diagram you put up here about just how thin that ocean layer is compared to yeah. the uh, mantle of the Earth. Yeah. So, so it really can. Volcanoes don't really have the strength to uh, warm up the ocean. Let's talk about El Nino. Okay, it's a point source, uh, and none of the scientists know why they form. I've shown that it's geological. It warms a large uh, portion of the Pacific Ocean. That's the first part of my answer. The second part is we've talked about this continental drift and how these huge faults are moving it up to one to two inches per year. Well, there's 50,000 miles of them around the Earth, and the uh, width of those things, they're just not individual faults, and I've shown them as kind of narrow fault zones. Actually, their effect extends out thousands of miles from them, and there's these cross faults, which we've talked about. A lot of those cross faults are active, and they have uh, hydrothermal vents uh, and um, volcanoes in them. So in addition to being 50,000 miles long and wide, uh, there's a lot of heat coming out of them, and I'm certain that they have the ability to heat the ocean. I was just asking about the great Pacific climate shift uh, around 1977 or so that appeared to heat up Alaska, for example. Do you have ideas on that one, or what caused it? Yeah, um, this is my theory. Again, I'm not a uh, climate scientist, but um, 
these climate shifts happen in very localized areas. Um, so in addition to that localized area, they said there's been warming in a specific areas of the Arctic Ocean, uh, specifically up in uh, Russia, where there's a lot of wildfires. There actually aren't any wildfires all over the area. So there's specific climate uh, here and there. So that's part of it. Pulses of heat are warming the Bering Sea. In 2014, there was a dramatic increase in warming at the Bering Sea. And um, that uh, really forced a lot of changes uh, in the a climate above the Bering Sea and then melted the sea ice to the west there. So these localized changes like the one in Alaska are, really are just based on changes in the geology. Uh, another consideration, which is a little more far-reaching, is that when we talked about glacial ice cycles, there's pretty strong uh, changes there. Well, if you're a statistician, what you know is that there are many cycles of changes. So there are changes over thousands of years, kind of up and down changes. There's up and down changes in 100 years and uh, 10 years. That's just the way statistics work. So when you look at a change or changes in a specific area, it could be one of these little specific uh, changes. The overall change, of course, is um, warming or changing climate. But these little teeny details uh, can make some changes there. Very, very good. So I want to make sure I have the uh, terminology correct, that it, it, we shouldn't be saying that uh, what you're talking about is volcanic uh, heat causing the oceans to warm. We should be saying geologic heat. Is that better? Or what's the best way to say that? Yeah, that's that's certainly a better way to say it. And then are you in touch with any other folks uh, working in this area? Like on my podcast, Brian Catt has mentioned this uh, as a, this whole heating of the water uh, geologically. Also, Joe Bastardi. I, are you working with anybody uh, else uh, that's working in the same area or any other books or anything that we should be reading up uh, about this? There aren't any books like this, as best I can tell. I am working with a few of my uh, nerd uh, expert friends, um, and they're helping me find research and um, and kind of get this thing smoothed over. But um, no, another uh, any other people. I, I guess I would mention in addition to that, I've given three public presentations, one-hour presentations on this here in Denver. Uh, to various well-respected organizations, and um, they were well-received, and a few of those people have contacted me and asked me to present um, to various government uh, organizations here in Colorado. Uh, not my thing. We are going to do some marketing of this, and maybe it'll eventually lead to some more uh, presentations. But in answer to, to your question more directly, there's just not a lot of people out there, and I really haven't uh, contacted them, but we'll get our marketing plan glowing here on the book, and maybe it'll spread the word. I would totally like to do this again, if you would like to. That, that sounds great. This is really good stuff. Thanks for having me.